as, uh, as I say these days, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. So both of, both of which are true. So my, my talk today, you know, I didn't have a snappy title. My talk today, because we kind of put this together on sh fairly short notice. But my, my talk is, my working title was Faculty Self-Governance, Social, Social Change, and Free Speech. And what I hope I can do, I'm going to kind of loop my way through a bunch of t things and kind of come back and hopefully time all together at the end. But really the three things I want to explore are what do we mean by self-governance in the academy? And particularly, what does it mean for faculty to govern themselves? Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what that has to do sort of with social change and the structure of the academy and how we think about what professors do and how we might change it. Um, and then I want to come back to the free speech and open, and open inquiry question. And when Josh sort of first proposed this, the first two parts of this were easy because that's more or less what that book chapter covers. And then, and I, and I read through it and I thought, I don't say anything about free speech. <laughs> I got to, what exactly does this have to do with free speech? And, and as I was sort of jotting some notes down and thinking about it, right, I, I got something I think interesting to think about here that I think matters for how we might, I'll sort of foreshadow it, but not the details, how we might think about what it means to program around free speech events on college campuses. How do we, if we, if we want to get students more sympathetic to free speech and open inquiry, how do we do that? And I think there's something to be learned here from all of this, what I'm going to do today, that suggests a way into that. It's not necessarily an easy one, but it's a different one than I think a lot of people have talked about. So that's, that's your sort of teaser for where, we're, where we'll end up. So let's start with this idea of self-governance. And probably before self-governance, we might even want to talk about the idea of democracy. Uh, before we started, Emily and I were saying to Emily that I wrote this chapter for this book she edited all about sort of self-governance and never cited Vincent Ostrom in it, even though if you read it, all the ideas are like Vincent's. So first, my apologies, Vincent, um, for not citing you. Uh, what's important, if you haven't read Vincent Ostrom, what's important in Vincent's work, particularly in the Meaning of Democracy book, um, uh, is this idea that democracy is more than just the formal structures of voting, of electing people, of who has what office and checks and balances and all these. And in fact, he's very clear in the last chapter of Meaning Democracies that, that the emphasis that political science has on power being the core to political science is a, is a bad way to start, right? For Vincent, and for Eleanor too, but certainly for Vincent, democracy is about collective problem solving. Right? We have these problems that we face as, as human communities, as human beings. We have to get together and solve those problems somehow. And if we want to think about it the way that sort of you know, classical liberals would think about it, we, we can talk about the state as being one way to solve those problems, and markets are one way to solve those problems. But what Ostrom, what Vincent's really interested in is things, and Eleanor too, that fall outside of those two categories. What are the ways in which we work together to solve problems that aren't the formal structures of the state, but are not the sort of, to use a kind of term from, from Hayek and Mises, the sort of catalaxy of the market, the catalactics, the, the, the sort of monetary exchange of the market. There are other ways. So democracy and therefore self-governance, right, the ability to engage in this problem solving, right, and governance, if we think about governance as meaning developing rules and enforcing those rules, they're more than just those formal processes. And this certainly goes back to de Tocqueville and the art of association. And I'm, when I'm done here today, I'm headed down to the Gateway, which is like my home away from home, that and the Marriott Fair Oaks, uh, to do a program for Mercatus, right, uh, as part of the Basquiat Fellowship. And we're reading a bunch of de Tocqueville and Vincent Ostrom, which is a nice way to bring this all together. But this certainly comes back to de Tocqueville and the art of association and the way in which that third sector of the civil society, whatever you want to call it, is really important to how we think about, uh, how we think about solving the problems we face as, as a community. Um, one of the things that Vincent Ostrom talks about that particularly interests me and is going to come back later in this talk is that this is also related to how we learn as children and how we raise children. And Ostrom, Vincent is very uh, repeatedly notes that these skills, right, this art of association, these skills at self-governance are things that we have to learn as children. If we don't learn them as children, we may not ever develop them. And I want to, that's something I'm going to come back to later on. So what do we, again, mean by, by self-governance here? In order for people to get together to solve problems, and you can think about sort of Eleanor Ostrom writing about the commons, you can think about a, a committee doing its work. There's all kinds of examples of this. 
for, for us to do these things, we have to be able to operate with other human beings in a realm of mutual trust, where we can exchange ideas with one another, where we can be open to criticism, where we can work together and sort of figure out what's the problem, how do we set this thing up, how do we talk about it, how do we solve it. Right? We, you need those sort of foundational relationships of trust in order, in order to do that. And much of what Ostrom points out is, is that, one, we need that, but how do we generate that? And I'm going to talk about how we might generate that trust in the context of faculty and academia in a little bit. But you can think about in a more broad sense, right, the time we spend face to face with people engaging in conversation, talking about what it is that we do, right, trying to figure things out, right, are all ways that we build that trust. One of the things uh, that I am always disturbed by, by my economist colleagues who I love, I was department chair for many years and, and they used to drive me crazy with this, is how, how much economists hate meetings, right? Because I say, oh, it's, it's transaction costs, it's too costly, I don't want to go to, I got better things to do, we're not going to get enough time. Right? No, what you don't see is the time that we spend in those conversations in meetings, if used wisely, are ways in which we build up those foundations of trust, of understanding, of empathy, right, that enable us as a group to work together more effectively. Now, I talk like that, economists all roll their eyes at me, right? Okay, but the problem is, if you don't build those things up, and you can't figure out how to solve those problems collectively in those constructive ways, what you're going to end up with is somebody making a decision and everyone else being unhappy about it, right? And my, my joke for a long time, especially at St. Lawrence, was, was about, you could always tell who a faculty member was, because they would say the following two things without noticing the problem. They would say, um, if I have to go to one more meeting, I'm going to kill someone. And then the next sentence would be, wait, the administration made a decision without consulting us? Right? Okay, wait, you, you know, you can't have it both ways. Right? If you want to self-govern, you have to self-govern. You have to actually be involved and do those things and build up those relationships of trust. What, in, in Vincent's work, what this leads to is what he calls covenantal relationships. And I love the word covenant used in this context because it's not a contract, right? It's not a contract. It's an agreement among us, right? And there's the whole biblical use of covenant that I think is fascinating there, too. But it's covenantal relationships and agreements where we get together and we come up with you can think of this from a kind of standard uh, uh, sort of public choice -y type perspective, but rules of the game, right? What we're agreeing on is what are the foundational things, norms, and so on that we think are important. We agree to those. We agree to certain processes. That enables us to engage in this, this, this problem solving. And again, this is neither the market nor the state, and it's not this formal democracy of the state, right? It's about how we problem solve. And you can see why Vincent and Eleanor, <laughs> right? Because Lynn's work on governing the commons is exactly this. Right? It's about how communities develop these covenantal relationships, these agreements, these historic practices to govern the commons, to govern the various, I mean, if you think in the commons narrowly, but you can think of this in terms of a whole bunch of different problems that people might, have, might solve. This, I think, is these sorts of things are what we mean by self-governance within the context of democratic institutions. And I think it's important to, to talk about it this way for a bunch of reasons. We've allowed the word democracy to become defined in the way that Vincent wants to reject, right, rightly, which is in this sort of formal notion of elections and balance of power and all this kind of stuff. But there is this bigger notion of democracy that, to Tocqueville and others, right, as as self-governance, as how do we solve our problems together. It doesn't have to be through the ballot box, right? It can be through these other, these other kinds of ways. And, and in fact, when we think about all the ways in which during the course of a day we come into conflict with other people and we figure out how to solve those problems through our sort of acquired notions of fairness and, and so forth, right? we really do invoke this notion of self-governance a lot. We don't expect the state to solve all of our little problems. Right? We don't expect markets to solve all of our problems. Sometimes just human beings getting together have to do that. So with that, what does this look like for faculty in the academy? And it's the same, the same dichotomy exists there. When, when we talk about faculty governance in higher ed, when faculty talk about faculty governance in higher ed, what they tend to think about is committee work and elected positions, the formal governance process, right? And, and my former institution is in the middle of a, their every 10 year review right now. And one of the things I was asked to do as sort of part of my retirement process was to serve as a kind of consultant for that 
that the review document. And the chapter on the governance process there is always the hardest one to write because every college has the same problem. Well, we want to be self, faculty want to be self-governing, but there's too many committees and there's too many of this, right? But everybody has the same kinds of problems. But notice, right, they're focused on the formal structures. And they're not thinking about the kind of faculty equivalent, which is what are the other ways that faculty and other members of the university community work together? What are the informal ways that we work together and problem solve? So just as one example, and these are, I'm going to pull some examples from the, from the uh, chapter in, in the book Emily edited that come from St. Lawrence, um, but are generalizable in a whole bunch of ways. So what are some examples of things faculty can do that amount to self-governance but are not part of the formal governance structure? Well, one is working on new initiatives. Right? We want to create a new major. We want, to we want to revamp our writing program. We want to create a community-based learning program. Whatever it is that we might want to do, right? faculty who get together, and this is the shop floor metaphor that's in the title of that chapter, right? faculty who get together on the shop floor and say, there is a problem with our students or with our curriculum or with our pedagogy that we hope we can solve by doing these kinds of things. Many of the examples in that chapter are taken from St. Lawrence's first year program, which I was involved in as a faculty member for the time, all the time I was there, and was associate dean for six years. And the interesting part of the history of that program was there were several problems it was designed that faculty had noticed in the early to mid 80s that it was designed to, uh, uh, to try to solve. One was our students weren't writing very well. Okay. Uh, second was that our students didn't really have a conception of what liberal education was. Uh, the Greek system was extremely powerful and dominated social life on campus, and the notion of living, learning communities, the only thing one could imagine close to that was a Greek house, and it really, the, the learning going on there wasn't really what we had in mind. It's not, I was about to say there wasn't any learning. No, there was learning going on. That, that, that was, in fact, the problem, right? So, so as a kind of countervailing force to the Greeks, and so there were all these things happening, right? And faculty were thinking about these things, got together, and sort of said, well, we've got, we're doing these little things over here. Can we pull this all together and sort of create something that, that, go, that, that goes after all of these kind of things, right? And it turns out that program at St. Lawrence was created, to use the language you kind of used, from the bottom up, right, from the shop floor, by faculty. And that's really important. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit and talk about why that's important, but you can already, perhaps, this crowd in particular, understand why that's important. But generating new initiatives from faculty is really, is, 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 another, is sort of, part, part of a key part of the self-governance. Many top-down administrative edicts just don't work. And one of the things I saw happen when I was associate dean of that program, I would go to other schools who were thinking about something like this, right? Um, and uh, you know, you'd sit with the administrators who would clearly think, oh, we got to have a program like this because it's working so well and we need to deal with retention or whatever problem they had, right? And so we really need a program like this. And you talk to the faculty, and the faculty are like, I don't know. And I would just walk away going, well, that's not going to work, right? Because until you've got faculty buying into it and recognizing that these sorts of things are the way they solve, that problems that they can solve, right? You're, you're not getting, one, you don't have self-governance, right? You've got imposition, administrative imposition of things from the top down. So when I would go on these kind of consulting gigs to these other schools, I would, my main goal was to go to the faculty and say, you need to persuade yourselves that something like this is worth doing. And if you think it's worth doing, you need to take control over how this process unfolds. Otherwise, you're going to have it imposed on you, and it's not going to, you're going to be miserable, it's not going to work, uh, and so on. So collaborating on new initiatives. The, one of the advantages of the shop floor right, of, is that people at the shop floor know what the problems are. So if you think about sort of Lynn Ostrom's work on governing the commons, right, how do we solve these commons problems? We, you need to know what's, well, okay, what's the resource, right? What are the ways people use it? What are the patterns here? How, what, what, how do people respond to particular kinds of enforcement mechanisms? That's all very localized, spread out, bottom-up knowledge. Those, it's those people with that knowledge who need to come up with the ways of governing the commons because they have that kind of information. Same is true with faculty, right? So working, finding faculty and getting faculty to recognize that they can and should control these kind of processes and, and, inst and uh, instigate them, uh, I think is really important. And once you begin to work on new initiatives, right, there's all kinds of ways that self-governance plays into making those things happen. One of the most effective things that was part of the culture at St. Lawrence was peer-to-peer uh, -peer workshops, right? 
we sometimes would bring in outside experts to help us you know, teach writing or teach speaking or, or you know, something like that. But we quickly drew on other faculty at St. Lawrence who had experience in teaching those, whatever the topic was or using that particular pedagogical you know, uh, innovation. And we let them work, you know, we, we taught each other in, in, in a number of ways. And we had faculty in the English department, right, who did a lot of work helping faculty in other departments learn better how to teach writing, and especially, I should be moving more than English, folks in our communication, speech, and theater department were, you know, devoted hours to helping us learn how to teach students to become better public speakers. Um, because, by the way, right, as faculty, we write all the time, and we have, I think, a little bit better sense of what constitutes good writing and how to kind of get it out of students, even if you've never been formally trained. Teaching students to be good public speakers, though, one, there's, there's plenty of bad faculty writers, but there's plenty of bad faculty speakers, right? And sort of this, that, I think there's a different, we're not at all trained to teach the, the speaking skills. And certainly, you know, over the years that Emily and I have worked with the Mercatus PhD students, right, it's, you, you have a re, much better skills than I do at teaching that, but I think it's something you really have to work hard to acquire. It's not natural in a way that writing is a little bit more natural, I think, than, than speaking. So again, peer-to-peer -peer workshops, bringing, bringing faculty into this. The other thing we used a lot, and, and this is why you need that culture of trust, is peer review of teaching materials. So one of the parts of the first year program was every course that was part of that program, the syllabus was peer reviewed by other faculty. Uh, groups of small faculty. When I was associate dean, I read all, whatever, 32 of them, 36 of them, at least you know, gave each one of them a read and provided some feedback. So the idea of exposing your syllabus to peer review from other people in your, in your local community, right? That's a very powerful form of self-governance, right? If you think about what that does, it enables groups who have a certain set of values and a certain set of goals to help continue those, to maintain those goals and to bring those, to constantly make sure that the things in the program are living up to those goals because you've got this accepted uh, procedure, right, and, and, and this tru the trust that it, it involves to do this. We also put all our syllabi online, which was another, right, that eliminated some, <laughs> you know, pe people couldn't get away with stuff, right, because you'd go look and see, right, what are you actually teaching in this course? Part of our, by the way, part of our felt responsibility to the rest of the university as well, right? This was a university program, and so you know, the, the whole college should know, should know what, we're, what we're up to. Related to that, and taking it actually to the next level, and this is something I talk a lot about in the, in the chapter, I'm not gonna talk quite as much about today. Uh, another way to develop, for faculty to develop these sort of the self-governance and this a mutual responsibility is team teaching. Now, team teaching is, we as faculty, most faculty, are used to thinking of our classrooms as these very private spaces. Yeah, there's you know, a bunch of students in them, but they don't count. Right? They're private in the sense that our, our colleagues don't invade that space, right? And when they do inv invade it, right, and I use that word intentionally here, it's often within the context of some kind of structure or power dynamic. You're coming in to review me for tenure. You're coming in to review me to renew my contract, right? You, it, it's, it's never, well, I shouldn't say never, but it's, you know, it, it doesn't nearly happen enough that we say to our friends, come watch me teach today, help me get better, right? That's a, you know, we don't do that a lot and enough. If you're team teaching a course with someone, every single day there's this other person in the room with you, you're watching them, they're watching you, you have to, the two of you have to engage in this kind of Ostrom problem solving all the time, right? But you're also exposing yourself in these ways, you've, you've unprivatized the classroom, and that's really powerful for generating trust, and for generating the ability to be open and honest with each other. I think this also has an important implication for the sort of free speech stuff that I'm gonna come back to later on, all right? But it, what it does is, it, the way I would put it now is it, team teaching enables us to recognize that our colleagues, whatever our disagreements are with our colleagues over ideology or disciplines or whatever, when you watch someone teach, you will recognize whether they care about students or not and how they do it, and that that's an important value to them. And if you can get that out there in the playing field and get you to see that your colleagues who you disagree with actually are good teachers and they care about students in the same way you do, you've created that kind of foundation for real work together that is often missing, I think, in a lot of places, right? And, and you can start to see how this might relate to the free speech and open inquiry thing, but I'm gonna come back to that later on. Another quick point. 
is faculty have to be willing to take leadership responsibility for the things that they value. And I think it's, you know, uh, when I think about IHS and, and, and Mercatus, I think one of the things to pay some attention to is who are the, and it's self-serving for me to say this, but I think it's true anyway, but who are the faculty who are rising to leadership roles within their institution? And not just like people who are in charge of, they got a Koch Foundation grant, they're in charge of it, but really are recognized by the other people at their institutions as, as sort of administratively capable, uh, who, who, are, who are engaging in leadership roles in various ways. Because that's a signal, right, about their willingness to take responsibility, their willingness to engage in the self-governance, and the respect that their other colleagues have for them, right? So if we're thinking about faculty who uh, are effective in working across barriers and working across differences, faculty who are aspiring to and succeeding in internal leadership roles at, on campuses, I think, are, are important. But I think there's another dimension to this, which is a kind of ethical responsibility for faculty who create new programs to be willing to stand up and take a leadership role in them. That's part of what it means to self-govern. If faculty are going to take responsibility for the curriculum, for pedagogy, for all these sorts of things, they have to be willing to oversee those processes. One of the great, again, this is sort of singing the praises of my former employer, one of the great things about St. Lawrence was all of our, our main dean position, all of our associate dean positions, I think, all of, all of those rotated through the faculty. We never hired from the outside since the last, <laughs> the last dean we hired from the outside hired me in 1989, so you can make of that what you want. Um, but since then, everybody's been an internal hire, and I think that's great, right? It, there, there's a cost to that, right? You don't quite maybe get the influx of fresh ideas that might be valuable. But at the same time, it reflects a willingness on the part of the faculty to step up and take responsibility for the, for the kinds of things that, that people are doing. And that's a good culture, I think, when, when you have that. In general, time spent together in doing this kind of work among faculty, develops trust, creates a culture of shared values that enables open discussion and criticism uh, and, and the progress that those can bring. I'll note two other things. It also means that the formal governance process becomes more effective. When you have shared values, you can, there are certain things you have to, you know, curricular innovations have to be passed by a majority of the faculty, whatever, I and mean, you've got these bylaw type rules that you have to follow. That process will work much better when you have the other things happening that enable people to, to have that trust in each other. And places where we've seen bad things happen recently, I suspect, are places where, where that foundation of trust just, just, didn't, just didn't exist. I'm, I'm thinking now of Wellesley in particular, but sad to say. Um, the other thing is, is that, when you do this from the bottom up the right way, you have the ability to codify those informal practices into more formal covenants, right? You can then sort of take the things you're doing and say, all right, now we're gonna, in, we, this is the word we tend to like, we're gonna institutionalize these things. We're gonna make them into something more structured, more formal. You always have to watch that doesn't ossify and bureaucratize and all these kind of things, right? And sort of the challenge of having an institution that is still open to change and evolution over time is a very uh, tricky one. I don't have any, super wise words about that, but I think it's important to be at least aware that you want to make sure you, to try to do that. So when you're practicing this, when faculty practice these forms of self-governance, I think the formal structure becomes more, uh, more effective. And this is, again, why you need, why, this is a way of thinking about a bottom-up social change, right? That it's got to come from, what we learn from the Ostroms is, <laughs> right? It's coming from the people who are experiencing the difficulties, who know the circumstances around the problem that needs to be solved, and who are willing to engage in the self-governance to, uh, to attack those things. And I think that effective social change in the academy emerges out of these forms of self-governance. Social change tends to stick better when it comes from the, bottom, from the bottom up rather than the top down for all the reasons good Hayekians understand, right? Local knowledge, um, uh, lo uh, local knowledge, the ability to coordinate more easily among small uh, uh, groups who know each other. I think, I think it's important to also keep a little, another little Hayekian point in mind that I bring up in the, in the chapter, which is the sort of structure of production idea. And just remember that all social change, whether it's you know, starting a new program at a, at a university or whatever, goes through that kind of Hayekian structure production process. You have to start with raw materials, right? You have to move your way through that to the ultimate consumer or who the, what the ultimate uh, output is. And I think just remembering that those things take time and that different people will have different expertise to add at different points in that process, right? The division of labor matters 
um, is, is really is important, is important there too. Um, sometimes I think in the context of, of, of academia, faculty just want to you know, wave their magic wand and make things happen. And, and, and remembering that it, that it takes time to produce things and that the, in that the time involved in that process is itself in some ways an input right, in, in the kind of conversations that have to take place. Uh, I'll just one anecdotal story from my time as an as associate dean. I knew that it was probably time to step down. I loved the job, but I knew it was time to step down when I was losing my patience with process, where I was like, I, I know what the right answer is here. You guys are busy. I know what the right answer is. You're still talking. I don't have time to listen to you guys talk anymore. Right? You get that temptation when you've been in the job for long enough to know. But once you start thinking that way, you've undermined these very values of self-governance and the sort of patience to let people get to where you want to go. We had a president at St. Lawrence at the time who was a terrific president, and, and uh, I always said the mark of a good leader is someone who uh, gets you to go where that person wants you to go without ever tipping their hand that that's what they're doing. Right? And, and I, that sounds more manipulative than I mean it. I don't mean it to be manipulative because it can be, right, it can be a very good place to go, okay? And if you're able to create the conditions and persuade people and do it in a way that never feels like you're being bossed around, but rather it's a person saying, look, I know you guys want to get to here. I'm going to help you get to here without you realizing it's really me, <laughs> you know, sort of doing this and let, let you feel, which is in some sense genuine ownership over it, right? Good leaders are good, to use Hayek's metaphor, right, are good gardeners, are good cultivators who create, who, 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 who lay the groundwork for people to do the things that, that, uh, that will work. And again, I think one of the things to think about when we think about social change on campus is it, it, leadership matters, right? Leaders, leaders create conditions, they set the rules of the game, they, they role model, they do all kinds of things. Um, one of the other things I think, and this is true for any social bit of social change, but but thinking about faculty and campuses is particularly important. Those on the shop floor trying to innovate have to bring skeptics into the process in whatever ways that they can. If you try to do this without including, at least attempting to include the skeptics, you're also going to fail because you don't have enough broad buy-in. Um, the first year program at St. Lawrence was very controversial for the first probably 15 years of its existence for a variety of local and national reasons. And, and there was always a kind of core group of skeptics among the faculty. And when I became associate dean, one of my goals was to, to every year have one of that group of faculty agree to teach in the program. Right, how do I pull this person in? How, what can I do to pull this person in? And I, I think I did that. If not, I came pretty close. All right? And so I think thinking about how do we bring skeptics in, and for me, when we think about larger scale political change, those of you who know me and my work know that this for me has been a long standing kind of concern of mine and, and something I take very seriously, which is how do we talk to people we disagree with? There's another terrific essay in that collection by my former colleague at St. Lawrence, Tracy Fordham, about how we talk across ideologies. Um, and Tracy has much to say, and Tracy and I don't see the world in the same way, suffice it to say. Uh, and, but we're very good friends, and we've sort of done, we've done workshops and taught together. And so all these sort of thinking about these questions, how do we talk across difference? How do we bring skeptics in? How do we frame our arguments for whatever change we're thinking about in ways that are inviting in rather than shutting down? Right? All of those, I think, are really important. And notice, that fits into that Ostrom perspective, right? where what we're trying to do is collectively problem solve, build trust, right? and, and do all of those kinds of things. OK, so I take my quick breath here and then ask the big question. What does this have to do with free speech and open inquiry? Maybe you can see some of it. Um, first thing I want to say is when we think about those issues on college campuses, I want to remind you that there's at least three constituencies, three groups we, we think we want to talk about. We know two of them because we talk about them all the time. We talk about faculty and we talk about students. We tend to forget, however, staff. And in particular, if you pay attention to these, you know, these stories about abridges, abridgments of free speech or open inquiry or the craziness that happens on campus, it's often the case that staff members, and particularly student affairs staff members, are deeply in the middle of this. Now, I'm not going to, you know, I think there's reasons why, let me, let me put it this way. Student affairs staff are often not very well enculturated 
into the academic mission of the university. This is something that universities have to actually concentrate and focus on to, to accomplish. If you hire a residence hall director, if you hire a system director of you know, orientation or something like that, right? You are, most schools don't even think about, well, how do we get them to think about academic freedom and, op and open inquiry and life of the mind? You're hiring someone for a job. Schools that do think about that are, are somewhat exceptional, and it's awesome when they do, okay? But I want to emphasize, right, when we think about change on, so, on college campuses, that group of people frequently doesn't appear in the picture, right? And, and they're really important. In fact, if you talk to students, students' experience of college, those folks matter as much as the faculty do in many ways. The other group, by the way, who from a large group of students who matters even more than the faculty are coaches, right? Our athletic coaches. That's a trickier question, and especially if it's a Division I school, much trickier question. But we don't, but if we're, if what we're thinking about is what's the student's experience and what adults matter for students and how do we want to help sort of influence and change students, right? We get stuck on faculty and students as being the thing, but there's these other people involved there who matter and matter in ways we want to think about. I don't have any, I'm going to say one quick thing about staff in a minute, but, but I don't have great insights there, but I think we just have to take that into account. So, how does this all relate to free speech and open inquiry? With faculty, hopefully you can see it already, faculty who engage in these forms of self-governance and done so successfully have built mutual trust and a common core of values that allows them to treat each other with what, with what I would call a hermeneutics of trust rather than a hermeneutics of suspicion. And what I mean by that is that their default position with their colleagues is to think, okay, Steve must be doing that for some good reason. I know Steve. Right? He cares about his students. The students say he's a great teacher. I've taught with him. Right? I know this. Why is he doing this thing that I might otherwise think, why is he doing this? Right? But there must be a good reason. I, I just put a footnote here. Uh, I often wonder what my St. Lawrence colleagues, well, some said so, but not many, what, sort of how they digested uh, my Koch Foundation grant and their perception of the Kochs with what they knew about me as a colleague. Like, well, wait a second. Right. Steve's done these, what do you think are good things, but now he's got coke grants. Why is he taking money from those people? Right. So what is, how do you resolve that apparent, right? I mean, hopefully you, you, know, you have a kind of that hermeneutics of trust rather than a hermeneutics of suspicion. And I think if you do the faculty governance thing right, again, I'm taking it away from me individually, faculty in general, right, begin to trust each other and begin to think, okay, uh, let, let, we, you know, let's do this. There's a problem here, by the way, which is a kind of political economy problem, which is, if everybody trusts everybody, everything's everything everybody's doing is great, then when you actually have to go to the formal governance process, there's a certain danger of you saying yes to everything everybody wants to do, right? And then suddenly we've got 4,000 majors and nobody to staff it, right? So uh, part, hopefully part of what you build up in that mutual trust is the ability to say no when you have to say no. That's the really hard part. How do you, how do you look at your colleagues who you like and trust and say, you know what? We just can't do that. And by the way, saying we is a lot better than you just can't do that, right? We just can't do that. And making, being able to make that case sort of, again, in this shared set of knowledge about the institution, this shared set of values. So I think that's a tricky part, too, in this sort of internal faculty dynamic here. I think one of the ways to get faculty to develop this trust and this sort of hermeneutics of trust is, is again, the team teaching point, right? Team teaching across disciplines and ideologies is really key. If you can begin, if faculty can begin to see their colleagues as liberal educators who care about students in the same ways that they do, the fact that you differ about this issue or that issue or those issues becomes less important. And as a kind of practical, what do we do about this? I think supporting programs that encourage that kind of dialogue across difference among faculty are probably worth investing in, okay? Um, I, I don't think debates are the way to do this because debates set it up as a win-lose sort of thing. But genuine conversation. I had a whole bunch of fun last, yeah, two, two, like last fall, it was in the fall, so 16, 2016. Um, and I'm off next week to do this again. With the, you may know this guy, Jerry Friedman, who's an economist at UMass Amherst. Jerry is a, was an advisor to the Bernie Sanders campaign, informal. Um, he is a very far left economist for a number of years. Uh, he and I have done this uh, uh, this seminar uh, at, at uh, 
Western New England University, which is sponsored by Fee, uh, partially sponsored by Fee, which is uh, we you know we take two topics and we present two different sides, and and it's not a debate, right? It's just two different sides and an opportunity for students to hear the same topic approach in two ways. Jerry's a great guy. He cares about students. It's never a fight between the two of us, right? It's always about how do we present this material for the students. A couple years ago, we went on the road. We did this at Creighton and then at University of North Carolina, um, Wilmington uh, on inequality. And it was great. And the students loved it. And I think these sorts of things where we expose students to multiple perspectives, where we give, where we show them that people can have a conversation across difference. And not, and not do it in that kind of artificial performance way, right, where you see sometimes. So that's not what you want to do. But a real conversation between two people who like each other, right, and who trust each other and can, can converse and disagree in these ways, I think that's really, really valuable. It's valuable for students, but it's also valuable for faculty in terms of creating culture on campuses, right, uh, that, that enable the free exchange of ideas. It's hard to attack your colleagues when you've seen how deeply they care about liberal education and, and students. Doesn't mean it won't happen. It's just a lot harder when you've got this environment in which people, when, when people know each other uh, as, as teachers and as scholars in, in these ways. A couple words about university staff like student affairs folks. I think if you include them in these processes of self-governance and in, in ways that, that are feasible, you can build similar trust there and reduce their hermeneutics of suspicion and the faculty's suspicion about them too, right? That, that they, that enculturating university staff into the world of the values of, of academic inquiry and open inquiry and so forth, I think is really, really important. Um, and it helps them understand why faculty do the things that they do. It helps them know how to deal with students who might get upset when they're being challenged in ways we think are legitimate and productive and, and part of the intellectual process. But if they're complaining to residence life staff about this thing that happened in the classroom, ideally you want residence life staff to be able to respond in a productive way that's part of under, you know, forwarding the goals of liberal education. So bringing them into that process in whatever ways campuses can do it is really, is really important. All right, so what about students? So here are some things to think about, um, including my sort of suggestions. As Josh mentioned in his introduction, I just I recently wrote, published, you know, published this book on, on Hayek and Modern Family, and so I think a lot about these issues of kids and family and, and so on. And as I said earlier, in, in Vincent Ostrom talks a lot about, he doesn't give us much detail, but he talks a lot about the importance of childhood and learning in childhood these sort of what we call kind of soft skills of self-governance, okay? And my, so my, one of my concerns has been in recent years is whether the, the sort of rise and maybe now decline of call it what you want, um, hyper parenting, uh, I like to call it corner solution parenting, which is no risk to our children is acceptable, right? We have, boom, right at the corner. There's no trade offs with kids, no trade offs whatsoever, right? We can't expose, we can't let our kids play outside because there could be a predator somewhere within a few miles who might scoop them up and take them away. Yet, by the way, we'll put them in the car, which is way more dangerous. But hey, just note that, right? Um, whatever you want to call it, right? This overprotectiveness, and in particular, the way it manifests, and the thing I'm particularly concerned with here, is the way it manifests in the absence of unsupervised play. Some of you may know this guy, Peter Gray, who's a psychologist, has written on learn, the role of play and learning. His book is called Free to Learn, okay? Is, is focused on sort of schooling issues, but the chapters on play in that are terrific. Virginia Pastrell, way back in 99, in, in, in the uh, Dynamism book, had a chapter on play also, which is terrific, right? So just thinking about unsupervised play in particular, not like formal Little League, right? And that's part of the problem. But kids just getting together to play in informal, unstructured, unsupervised ways. Think about the skills that children learn in those environments. I think that they're exactly the skills Vincent's talking about when we talk about self-governance. You have to figure out, you've got to figure out, you're going to play pickup baseball game. All right, what are the rules, right? Where, where are the bases, right? What are the rules? How many innings are we going to play, right? How are we going to do balls and strikes, okay? Is it a home run over that fence or this fence? You've got to figure all this stuff out, right? And then when conflict happens, you have to resolve the conflict. One of the most interesting points Gray makes in that book is in this very context. He says, when kids play pickup games together, and there's large skill differences between the players, 
the more skilled kids take it easy on the lesser skilled kids. And when I read that, I was thinking, why? And then I went to the next sentence. Well, of course, because if they don't take it easy on the lesser skilled kids, the lesser skilled kids leave. I don't want to play if you're going to throw a 90 mile an hour fastball at me and I'm a fifth grader, right? I'm going to leave. So the idea of having that consent, right, and having, getting agreement on everyone to play the game requires that people adjust and negotiate and change their behavior in ways to maintain that consent, right, throughout the, whatever the game is. Notice that this doesn't work in Little League. There's no real exit option, <laughs> right? You, you're in the game, stuck in the form. I'm not taking it easy on that kid, right? Much less likely to see that happen. And so what we develop, Gray argues, and I think, again, you can apply this to the Ostrom's way of thinking, is that when kids engage in unsupervised play, they learn all of these skills that are so important to self-governance, both collective self-governance, how we problem solve together, but the more narrow sense of literal self-governance. How do I govern myself? How do I learn how to get along with other kids? I have two stepdaughters who are uh, 12 and 10. Um, the 10-year-old is, I think, Bossy is the word I want here. Very bossy. That's why she and I are like this. Because I don't take well to bossy, and neither does she. But she's very bossy, especially to her older sister. Okay? And they were making cookies together the other day. And the older one has finally learned how to deal with this, which is when the younger one starts getting bossy and insisting on everything her way, the older one says, I'm done here now. You can make the cookies by yourself. And walked away, right? and went upstairs. And I was listening to this from my office. Right? All right. And there was this moment of silence, right? And the younger one then starts pleading with her to come back. Right? No, no, pleading is not the right word. Screaming at her to come back. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, I'm thinking, saying to myself, the older one's name is Abby. I'm saying, Abby, don't give in to that. Let her scream. And eventually, the younger one, the tone reduced. And the word please appeared. <laughs> Abby came back down. Yes, let us go. OK, and they finished, managed to finish making the cookies without killing each other or giving me a heart attack. So th it's that, it's uh, the ability to exit and the ability to say no, right? And learning that negotiation process is really important. I'm going to make a little detour. And this is something I talked about in a blog I did for you guys a while back. It's not central to the point I want to make here today, but it's worth thinking about. I think this point that I've just made helps us understand why college students uh, struggle with roommate issues and with sexual communication issues. Um, if I, there's a really interesting thing to be written about sexual consent and all the stuff that we're talking about here and the ability for men and women, this is not about just women, right? This is about men and women, the ability to engage in the negotiations over relationships, whether it's room, you know, roommate issues or sexual communication issues, that are these kind of skills, right? And if you don't have those kind of skills, either you're going to just not exit when you should exit, right? You're just going to give in and be subject to the, to the will of the more powerful person, or you're going to try to solve them by bringing in some external authority, right? And that, that is, I mean, obviously there's cases in, when we think about you know, sexual assault where that's necessary. But in a lot of these cases where it's, a, where it's problems of communication, it's not clear to me that's the right solution. It, the solution is providing young people with the skills to, to negotiate these things out more clearly ahead of time so everybody knows where the boundaries are, right? So how might all of this be affecting the ability of college students to deal with disagreement in the classroom, with the disagreement over ideologies? How might it affect the likelihood that they turn to authority for protection or try to shut down the other side rather than engaging in true open inquiry and dialogue? In the face of feeling threatened and feeling harmed by other people's words, and I don't want to deny that those feelings are real, they are, but how does one respond to them? If one, responds, if one has no set of skills to respond to them by engaging with the with the people who are bothering you. And again, we know there's limits here. Someone, you know, we get a true neo-Nazi comes in and says things. That's one thing, right? But I'm talking about the more challenging cases where people say things that, that they don't mean to be harmful but are perceived as being harmful. How do we communicate that? How do we talk about that? How do we solve those problems, right? We're right into this Ostrom world of self-governance. Yet, if young people don't have the skills to do that, 
we're going to see the kinds of disasters we're going to see, where it's just easier to stand up and yell and scream and shout someone down or try to shut them up than it is to engage the conversation. And so here's my kind of way of thinking about this now. I think the mistake that we sometimes make when we work with students on these issues is that we, we assume, let me put it the other way, the challenge might be more that they lack certain skills and experiences than that they don't care about the things we value and that we think they should value. We say, oh, students don't care about free speech anymore. Well, maybe they do care about free speech, they just don't know how. They just don't know what to do when faced with these kind of situations that we're, that we're talking about, right? And that, when you look at it that way, suddenly this looks different. And what it suggests is, and here's my kind of programming message, right? When we think about campus programming around free speech and open inquiry, maybe we should be thinking more about how, about things that focus on those skills and exposing students to certain experiences and difference rather than debating the abstract legal and philosophical issues of free speech. I'm not persuaded that the latter strategy works to convince people that open inquiry and free speech is something they should value, students that they should value. It might, with the right people, it might. But I think the fact that what I, my reading of the polling data and reading through all these, I keep, you know, I have a morbid fascination with all these campus controversies for a variety of reasons because I'm waiting for it to happen to me. Um, and, and what would, and asking my, it's the, I like to call it the airplane question. What would I do if, right? Say, oh, say a fan blade comes off the engine of an airplane, right? Well, I'm on the blame. What do I do, right? That's, you ask yourself that question. Well, you know, when Uncle my campus comes knocking at my door, what am I going to do, right? So uh, I had it happen once already at St. Lawrence. So I think thinking about these things and sort of thinking about how we help students, what, how we might create experiences for students that help them develop the skills and aptitudes and trust and all these sorts of things that enable them to exist more constructively in a world where people disagree with them, right? That's the challenge. I am not, I don't have the expertise to know how to do that, right, in, in effective ways. And the last thing I want to do is sort of get groups of students in a room and have them play act all the, you know, no, 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 no. My daughter, my biological daughter, is a, a senior at NYU, and she's taking an absolutely incredible course this semester called Play, which is taught by two, people, two medical, uh, they're psychiatrists, actually, from the med school at NYU, but they, they work a lot with kids stuff. And so it's a whole course on the history of play, and it gets into this, they're reading Peter Gray, they're reading uh, Flow, and all this sort of stuff about how play is part of the human experience. It's just like, for, she's, by the way, a, a dramatic script writing major. So for her, sort of thinking about how human beings interact these ways is part of her, you know, is a helpful thing for her professionally, but it's like the perfect capstone course for four years to sort of think about this thing in those, in those ways. And it's taught by two very young faculty members who are doing it for the first time, and so they're trying to figure this out too. And they've had them engaging in these kind of group exercises in the class where the students have to actually work together and build something. And they were given like this like box full of stuff, like a rubber band and a pencil, and, right, and, and they had to make I don't remember what it was. It had to make something out of it, right? And so these group problems, okay, I get it. I'm not a big fan of that stuff, right? But and I don't think that's what one wants to do around free speech. But there's something there, right, about asking students to experience that process of having to work together. Fa the other thing faculty complain about is, is, and students complain about, is group projects. Right? Oh, we hate group projects, right? Well, okay. Right, well, why? Right. Now oh, someone's always going to free ride, right? And faculty say the same thing. But the question, again, is, do students even have the skills to sort of engage? That's a process of self-governance, right? all that stuff. So, so that's, my, that's kind of where I want to end today, right? Which is thinking about whether what we see on campuses as free speech problems are really problems of this kind of Ostrom self-governance uh, and set of skills uh, that, that perhaps faculty don't have too, but certainly that, that maybe students don't have because we've are the way that students are, are grow up and are raised has evolved in ways that they don't they ha have never developed as fully perhaps as generations past did th those particular skills. Students today have awesome skills that parents that their parents didn't have, but this may be something that they're lacking. So I think as as organizations think who who care about these issues think about what do we do on campus to you know to to, to forward free speech and open inquiry, at least thinking about this point and and what role it might be playing in those issues. Uh, seems to me to be worth your, worth your time and my time. So thank you all very much.